Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today I want to talk about XHP. XHP is a transmission tuning platform and it flashes onto the transmission control unit or TCU. The TCU is not locked like the ECU is so you can flash it without any modification. I've come across a lot of comments that bash automatics because they are not as engaging, fun, fast as a manual or a DCT. And yes, this is all true to some extent. In stock form, the ZF8 is pretty numb in terms of feel, and it's pretty laggy as well if you use the paddle shifters. Well, XHP addresses all of these problems and unleashes the true potential of the ZF8. If configured correctly, you can have instant shifts, amazing feedback, and increased control, and together have one of the best overall performing transmissions to date. I'm going to start off by quickly talking about the uh, different stages and then focus on the custom settings. My transmission is a ZF8 HP51 since my car is a Gen 2 B58, so we're going to use that as a reference, but it applies to all the other ZF8s as well. So let's get started. The first thing you have to choose is the base map. Stage 0 is just a stock map. Stage 1 removes the torque limiters. So what this means is that the TCU is not going to request a lower number from the engine and limit the torque that it can provide. This is required if you have any sorts of modifications that increase torque, such as an engine tune. For stage 2, we can see that along with everything in stage 1, it modifies the map to make it more aggressive. And we'll talk about all the details in just a moment. Finally, stage 3 is everything in stage 2, but a few more features. The main thing here is that if you put the car in Sport and DSC off, it's going to enable a race shift map, and this essentially means that it's going to refuse to upshift and downshift until necessary. Okay, so let's go into the custom settings. The first group is shifting. For the first setting, we have the shift map editor. This allows you to alter the shift point or when it will upshift or downshift depending on the RPM. You can configure them for both D and also S mode which refers to the gear selector switch. You can choose from a variety of presets, or you can make your own custom one. It will perform automatic error correction for you, so that means it won't allow you to set gear 1's upshift above gear 2's downshift, or something nonsensical like that. A good way to create your own shift map is to try the presets, find the one you like, and then copy those values into the custom slot and adjust them. I personally like to set both the sportive, D and S are relative to each other, so even with both set to sportive, S mode is still going to be more aggressive than D mode. Next, we have an option to use stock shift maps, which bypasses any of the modifications made to the shift points in the base maps for stage 2 and stage 3. You can enable this and still set custom shift points, but it will just use the OEM points as the reference. Next, we have torque reduction during upshift. When the transmission switches gears, it sends a signal to lower the amount of torque being generated by the engine to smoothen the process, because the shifts overlap and the ongoing clutch has to overcome the torque of the engine to pull down the RPM to the new gear. Basically, the less energy that needs to be transferred, the quicker this process is completed. This can be done in various ways, such as modulating the valve trotic system for reduced intake, or retarding engine timings. However, if you have stage 2 or 3 selected, it's going to be done using ignition cuts when above a certain RPM and torque. Ignition cuts leave the throttle open and the injector spraying fuel, but tell the spark plug not to fire on one or more cylinders. This means that the mixture is not ignited in the cylinder, but rather pushed down and is ignited when it comes in contact with the hot exhaust manifold. If it ignites there, then that energy is applied to perform work on the turbo rather than the crankshaft. In a sense, ignition cut shifting is like short bursts of anti-lag, because it spins the turbos to build or maintain boost, but doesn't generate any torque in the drivetrain. Now, when fuel is ignited in the exhaust manifold, then you're going to hear it, so ignition cuts produce a distinct sound. If you want to hear what they sound like, I have a few videos. They are the loudest sound that is produced by the car. Now, you'll still want a high-flowing exhaust system to hear them, so that means high-flow or catless downpipe, straight mid-pipe, and a back box that allows for muffler bypass through valve control so that the sound isn't absorbed. Now that we know what ignition cuts are, we can talk about what these sliders do. So if you increase the torque reductions, or move the slider to the right, then you are requesting more torque to be cut from the engine during the shift. 
this is going to result in faster shift times and more of the sounds being generated because the torque cut has to be applied longer and on more cylinders. The drawback is some lag in power after the shift because you have essentially lowered the torque and also interrupted some of the exhaust gas flows for the turbo, even if it's just a small amount as ignition cuts are used rather than the other methods. If you're on the stock turbos, then lag is not really going to be an issue, so you can go ahead and increase it. I like about 5% on lower gears, and sometimes raise it to 10% on gear 3 and 4. Then I back it down to 0 on the higher gears. If you have a huge turbo, then you might consider lowering the slider or moving it to the left. And this is going to increase your shift time, but it's going to have the least negative impact on the power available after the shift, because the torque and boost do not drop as much. Next up is reassign shift speeds. So the ZF8 has three modes, which it selects based on the current driving. It's based on a lot of parameters. So if you're actually driving spirited, it's going to use the faster modes. And if you're just crawling, then it's going to use the slower modes. However, I find the standard mode too sluggish. It keeps the revs extremely low and is always wanting to get to a higher gear. It just makes daily driving and in comfort and D mode a bit too unresponsive for me. The solution to fix this, however, is not to make the shift points more aggressive in the shift map editor like we just talked about, but rather to change these settings. So I just set the standard to medium, meaning a medium shift speed is the minimum at any time. Overall, I find this makes comfort and D on the gear selector more comfortable of anything because it's not lugging the engine all the time. Next is ignition cut shifting. We just talked about what this is, but this setting allows you to configure when it is triggered by setting the threshold at which it activates based on the torque and RPM. If it's above the two values, it will perform an ignition cut shift. Now, my testing of this showed that setting these manually actually ends up triggering them less often, even if the values are set really low. I personally like the sound of ignition cuts on my exhaust setup, so I keep the manual adjustment off because it triggers them more often. But you still need to be at a certain accelerator position in RPM. It's somewhere around 3K and like 40% throttle for them to trigger. And this is because ignition cuts at low load scenarios are neither required nor are they good for the engine. If you're only after performance, then you can set them to a high torque and high RPM so they only trigger at wide open throttle, which is ideal. If you want the sound to be more present, then you can set them to medium values or just not touch it at all. Next is torque punch. This is the jolt or firmness you feel through the drivetrain during upshifts. The values mostly affect the wide open throttle upshifts in the Sport Plus setting. At stage 3 and no increased torque reduction during the upshifts, it's quite pronounced, so you can lower it if you don't like the feeling. If you like to feel the shifts, then you can leave it as is or increase the sliders. Try adjusting them by about 5% at a time. The last setting in this group, brake shifting, is a new feature that was just added. You've probably noticed that when you brake, the car will downshift automatically. And this depends on the mode you're in and also the brake force applied. But Sport Plus results in the most aggressive downshifting. And this is going to increase brake power due to engine braking and also puts you in the appropriate gear when coming out of the corner. I quite like the aggressive downshifts that I get in Sport Plus mode, but I usually drive in Sport Individual with the setting set to Sport rather than Sport Plus. So I'm going to increase these a bit to better mimic Sport Plus in the other modes. Okay, let's move on to the next group, which is limiters. The first is RPM, which sets when the upshifts happen at wide open throttle. It lets you go up to 9900, but of course the rev limiter is not going to allow you to go above 7k for the B58, so there's nothing to worry about. Now, this setting can actually help with performance, because generally speaking, the shift points at wide open throttle are a little too high, about 6700 for me, and so this takes you out of the optimal power band. But to know what the optimal power band is, you're going to need a dyno run through all the gears. If you can do that, then you can optimize the wide open throttle shift points pretty well, so you're always making max power. If you don't have a graph and want to fly through the gears for the fastest times, then I would test when it shifts at wide open throttle and lower the RPMs by a couple hundred. The B58, at least with a reasonable turbo, really doesn't need to rev out the red line to get the most power. Next is torque limits per gear. They say that this can be helpful if you are struggling with traction, and yeah, it can, but that's kind of like putting training wheels on your bike because you can't control it or the wheels are too thin. I personally like to have it off because it involves the driver more. You can't just throttle 24-7 in real-wheel drive. 
Where the setting becomes more useful is to protect the transmission. So generally speaking, the ZFA transmissions are good up to the maximum torque that the respective engine block can handle without internal modification. Now, that does depend on what you're doing and what gear you're in. Third and sixth gear, for example, are weaker. And if you're launching with aggressive brake boosting, then you might snap the stock drive shaft or other components. So this setting can be really helpful in preventing you from blowing up your drive line if it's not built and you're running high torque. Next is true manual. This allows you to redline and balance off the rev limiter in the modes that you choose. So for example, in sport mode and DSC off, if you're in manual, then it won't upshift for you once you hit 7K. It'll just sit there and balance off if you keep the throttle pressed. So I like to have this enabled on the modes that you can see as it just gives more control and fun. Next is limit gears. So this will allow you to set a min and max gear if desired. Pretty self-explanatory. The next category is launching and performance. First we have drag race mode, which essentially disables all torque reduction during the shifts to get best drag times. It's basically an extreme version of launch control and really shouldn't be used if you want maximum longevity out of the transmission. If you're at the drag strip and have prepared the car, then go for it. I'll talk a bit more about this in the next thing. So for custom launch control, there are two sliders. The first is set launch torque, and it's basically the boost level that will be built when launch control is initiated. The second is how fast that boost increases when you release the brake pedal. Now, you wanna be careful with these, along with the drag race mode and disabling protections and such. And this is because brake boosting is the absolute maximum load scenario for the transmission. The engine generates a certain torque, and this torque is going to be multiplied by the torque converter, which is around 1.9 during brake boosting. This is then multiplied by 5.25, which is the ratio of the first gear. And then it's multiplied by the final drive of 3.1. So if you do the calculations, the torque that can be going to your wheels is tens of thousands of newton meters. Just because the wheels aren't spinning doesn't mean the torque is not there. It is there, it's just being held back by the brakes. It's essentially like putting an impact wrench in a vise and holding the trigger. When you let go of the brakes and the wheels start spinning and the car starts moving forward, the multiplication factor of the torque converter is going to decay down to one. It's also going to generate less of a load if you go into second gear, which has a ratio of 3.3 and so on. So you can see just how much more torque the components have to handle in the initial launch compared to when the car is actually moving forward at a decent speed. Next is takeoff in second gear. This setting disables first gear, unless it's an emergency scenario. Some people like to enable it for increased comfort, I personally don't like my first gear, so I leave the setting disabled. Next is line pressure bump, which is going to increase the torque handling capacity of the transmission, and this might be needed for big turbo applications. Now we have the comfort economy group. The first is standstill decoupling. You've probably noticed this, and it's when you're sitting at red light, and it turns green, and you press the throttle, but there's a slight delay. It feels like there's a disconnect in the drivetrain, and this is because decoupling is enabled by default which cuts power flow when you're sitting there to reduce the pressure and possible vibrations you may feel. I don't launch control when the light turns green, but I do press the pedal relatively quickly and having the decoupling there is an annoying feeling, so I turn it off. In fact, this is actually worse if you also have the takeoff and second gear enabled. I'm going to skip ahead to auto start stop. You can read about the others yourself. They're pretty self-explanatory and just comfort fuel economy features. So everyone has experienced the auto start stop I personally find it super annoying. It's disabled by default in stage 2 and 3, so you don't need to do it again in these settings. However, to completely get rid of it, you also have to code it out using Beamer code. Only disabling it in Beamer code, or only disabling it in XHP to not get rid of it for me. I had to disable it in both. It will still activate if you pull into your driveway and go into park, but that's about it. It doesn't trigger anymore while driving. Let's move on to the driving group. Uh, the first two you can read about yourself, but I want to talk about throttle blips in M mode. So this setting is essentially the automated rev matching during downshifts. It sounds good and provides a lot of feedback, but the stage 3 settings are a bit aggressive for first and second gear, so I lower them slightly. I've played a lot with these values and these ones are pretty dialed in for me. You'll know if it's optimal if you can hear it. The downshift is crisp, doesn't sound artificial, and doesn't jolt the car. And finally here we have the gear display, which is enabled by default on all the stages, but you can disable it here if you want. 
And this just means when you're in drive in the gear selector switch, you'll see the gear you're in on the instrument cluster, like D1, D2, etc. Just like you normally see with S1, S2, and not just the D. So that's going to be it. Hopefully this service is a good guide for you to start experimenting. I personally run stage 3. I actually find it more refined than stage 2, especially after customizing the settings. Once you have it configured to your liking, it completely transforms the driving experience. That's going to be it for this video. Drop a like if you found it useful, and sub if you want to see more. If you have any questions, then post them down below, and also share your thoughts. See you in the next one.